Listener, thank you so much for joining us. Very special Euro show for us today. When I say today, I'm talking about Monday the 8th of April. Start of a week that's going to see the big European guns up against one another in a series of really massive continental fixtures. Ooh. Talk about that and much, much more. We've got that James Horncastle here. Hi, Jimbo. Hi, James. Alvaro Romeo's also turned up. Hola, James. Parafa's here, and he's just been to the dentist. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Ready to do some <laughs> okay. more filling. Okay. <laughs> you, filling in. You're going to give us a recap later. <laughs> 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 Yeah. Oh, yeah. and Jules. And Jules, who's still at home. Jules, what's going on? Hello, guys. Sorry, I had childcare issues. The bloody holidays, isn't it? Have no one there to take care of you. Sh- well, childcare issues? <laughs> yeah. The bloody so bad, holidays. So, bad. so, so bad. Yeah. Hey, who's excited about this week? Alvaro. Well, I mean... Tremendously. Uh, yeah. But whatever what comes, are we sure having? Whatever yeah. comes after oh. Saturday is nothing. Ooh. Ooh. Or Sunday, as no. many people call it. No, but no, no. What, well, no, because it was, it was 10 to 1 in a Sunday morning when the kick finally went in. Which one? What, what are you talking about? Talking the, Sp- the Spanish Cup final. Exactly. Yeah, whatever. Exactly. Ca- it finished at uh, what? Ah, it was, was, yeah, of course, 1, o- one was, o'clock. Yeah. 1 o'clock is Spanish time. Uh, yeah. 3 a.m. for journalists to leave yeah. the ground, by the way. Really? But yeah. Yeah, who cares about it? Uh, I forgot about the hour. I mean, no. The important thing was, you know what was the important thing? First title in 40 years. 40 years. 40 years, yeah. First big title. Wow. Alvaro, and you haven't stopped partying since, have you? Uh, I'm going to go to Bilbao uh, because yeah. on Thursday we are bringing out what we call La Gavarra, which is... The uh, barge. Uh, no, uh, oh. this uh, big uh, boat. Uh, yeah, yeah, the barge. I wasn't yeah. familiar with the term. <laughs> okay. Uh, okay. <laughs> I call it boat. That's how limited my English vocabulary is, oh, I guess. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, um, the boat will... Cross uh, Bilbao from Getxo, which is the mouth to the sea of Nervion River, to the council, uh, ha- how do you call it? The, 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 the city town hall yeah. of okay. Bilbao, yeah. yes. Yeah. And oh, it, yeah. it's going to be lovely. One million people are expected to be in Bilbao. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. How long is it since the bar- so the boat has floated? How, how do you call it, by the way? Barge. But I'll write it I down. mean, barge is a kind yeah. of... Boat, yeah, but it barred, how yes. it, it's been a while. You mentioned forty years. This boat only gets in an outing if you win a a, a a big trophy, a big trophy, not a super so cup, a big trophy. How worried are you that it might not be able to make this open season? No, the, the, some tests have been run have and all that. The rust has been removed, okay. obviously, yeah. since the final. I hope because that would make that would, I, I would be very nervous about doing anything prior. To yeah, I think today Monday was when they were just fixing it, uh-huh. tidying it up, and all that. Yeah, uh, it's probably more dangerous to go down to the river uh-huh. and then uh, cross to the boat. Uh, I remember that in 1984, when we won the last title, one of our players. Gisasola, he almost fell from the stairs to the river and he almost passed away after winning a cup. Yeah, so hopefully the access to the boat will be a little bit easier these days. Wow, right. What a way to go. That would yeah. Way to go. I don't know, he almost died, but he had a, a very he bad accident. Died, but, you know, he had a very bad accident, yeah. Wow. Yeah, a very bad ho- fall, yeah. My athletic preparing to push the boat out in a very real sense. Yeah. I guess that might be your moment of the weekend. Is that right, Albert? Uh, Have you got yeah. something else? Well, there, there nothing is, else happened. Uh, there is another one, though. Nothing oh. else happened. But, uh, you know, and Jules probably uh, knows about this. But today, the 8th of April, huh? and this is quite quite a weird thing, uh, yeah, uh, is the birthday of Mia, family. Amaro, and Alba, the three kids of Antoine Griezmann. Yes. And none of them are twins. And how well, they were born in different years. Different years, yeah. yeah. So uh, how yeah. did he manage? He, how did he and Mrs. Griezmann manage this singular feat? I don't know. Eighth of July or nine months before must have been like a tasty right. period for them. Elective caesarean. Yeah, that's more likely. Or maybe yes, he's yeah. deadly in front of both. <laughs> Simple as that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I hear what you're saying, Alvaro. I hear what you're saying. Nice, nice, James. Your moment of the week, stroke weekend. Many from the Rome Derby, I suppose. Mm. First time Roma had won one in two years. And boy, did they enjoy it. You had Paolo Dybala pulling out his shin pad and showing it to Guendouzi, the Lazio midfield player. That's the best. On the shin pad. Uh. You have Dybala lifting the World Cup and kissing it. Guendouzi was part of Jules' France team, which didn't win that final. So Guendouzi didn't take too kindly for that. Yeah, which to he be He was honest, so polite doing it. <laughs> it's like a, it's a great you, choice. Excuse me, have you seen this? <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, Dybala is such the boy next door. Yeah. You wouldn't expect this from him. But as James said, the way in he did fight, it was still very fight, polite. I with Genduzi. <laughs> okay. 
Uh, and then Gianluca Mancini, who would have stood up for Dybala had there been a fight. In many ways, like the kind of enforcer, the guy who, who made Jose Mourinho's Roma quite joyless to watch. It's just like, oh God, this guy's having a fight again. He's getting booked. And instead, in a derby, for him to score the only goal of the game and be the guy who essentially rubs everyone up the, way, the wrong way. He's, he's sort of like a... He's like Roma's Materazzi, almost. Mm. And after the game, he did a post-match interview in his underpants where he, he had to be... Lorenzo Pellegrini, the Roma captain, had to lend him his shorts because he'd thrown them into the crowd. Um, and then and then he was talking about how important it is, despite the win over Lazio, to be respectful to your opponents. And then he went back out and was given a flag from the Curva Sud where the Roma hardcore end, and that flag has Lazio's colours and a rat on it. Uh, so, you know, he became the Piferaio, uh, the, the Pied Piper of, of Laziali, because all the Laziali are rats in the uh, Romanisti view. Um, and... The Italian Football Federation's opened an investigation. <laughs> want to, I think, want to charge him for uh, misconduct. But mm. yeah, uh, very amusing. First win for De Rossi in that fixture as well as a coach, and big for Roma in, mm. in light in, in light of their Champions League ambitions with Bologna dropping points, with yeah. Atalanta dropping points. Yeah, and ahead of a huge Europa League clash on Thursday, their derby, European derby with Milan. We'll talk more about that later on. Rafa. Well, James, <laughs> <laughs> always works, doesn't it? Um, I think my moment of the week was the choreography from the Dortmund fans to mm. commemorate 50 years of the Westfalenstadion. Very, very moving. Dortmund won, wore a special shirt as well. They also came in with the uh, original women's football team who played the first game at Westfalenstadion. 50 in years ago. 50 years ago. What, they inaugurated the stadium? Yeah. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. And uh, they lost 1-0. Mm. Which <laughs> kind of yeah, spoiled the day a little bit. <laughs> against Stuttgart. Right. Against a very good Stuttgart side. And they probably should have at least had a draw because there are lots of chances. And uh, good old Nico Schlotterbeck missed an absolute sitter. Just uh, from underneath the bar somehow blasted it over mm. and uh, was asked afterwards how come you didn't score and got very very upset about the question it's like what kind of question is this do you think I wanted to not score blah blah blah, blah. <laughs> Germans um, getting upset in post game interviews I know I know Tony Cross style um, but yeah big big game with a big impact on the top four absolutely because uh, Russia Dortmund now behind Leipzig in the race for top four. Stuttgart a third, but only on goal difference. Because they're now level on points with second place. Bayern, yikes. We'll talk more about Bayern very, very shortly. But Jules, at last, your moment of the week. My moment of the weekend is the goal of the weekend. Maybe one of the goals of the season. Forget about uh, Girassi or Politano this weekend. Forget about Sunset. Forget about Bruno Fernandes, even. Because Tom Renault in the third division in France, for, for Cholet, against Goal FC, scored from inside his box, an incredible lob. I mean, Bruno next to it is literally like, you know, like me and, and Horny comparing our football abilities. It's just nowhere near as good. Woo! Tuesday, Arsenal take on FC Bayern and Real Madrid host Man City. Then on Wednesday, Atletico Madrid face Dortmund, but no one will be watching because on the other side, it'll be Paris Saint-Germain against Barcelona again. Oh, woo. let's begin... Let's begin with Arsenal Bayern, Rafa. These two sides have met each other four times in the knockout stages. Each time, Arsenal have been knocked out 10 2 on aggregate on the last occasion. But this time, Rafa, this time, it looks different. I wish I could turn back the clock, James, oh, yeah. to those days. Yeah. Um, yeah, where should I start? I mean,. A lot of people, strangely, in Munich, when the draw came out, thought, oh, this is really good. You know, Arsenal, they're not nothing. What have they done? Is Benga still in charge? In Europe recently, <laughs> you know, they're, they're, not, uh, they're not doing anything. But those who watched Arsenal, especially this season, of course, know what a formidable opponent they are. And mm. since the draw, momentum has even shifted uh, further towards the Gunners because Bayern's performances have been pretty poor. So Two one, defeats now in a yeah. row after first, the international break. First defeat at home to Dortmund in a decade. And now the first defeat against Heidenheim in whatever? 
Yeah, I mean, they've only played each other three times, but right. they've never been in the same division before. But also, the manner of it, 2-0 up at half-time, FC Bayern, and then? Just awful, awful. They considered two goals within a couple of minutes, and then 10 minutes before the end, the third one. Defending, I'm not sure that word is apt, but, I mean, Bayern were all over the place. Thomas Tuchel had changed a successful twin partnership as they are sort of colloquially known of Dyer and De Ligt, in back into Kim and Upamecano and not not good. Not good. Not good at all. And it's amazing considering how much money is tied up in like three centre backs there, no? Like Kim, De Ligt, Upamecano. Mm. It's not it's like they haven't 200, invested. Two hundred million euros, I think, mm. give and take. Um, and the first goal comes from a goal kick that they could I see. Know, I mean I don't know what to say. It's Did Tuchel bad. know what to say afterwards? No, not really. Um, he looked shocked mm. again um, and had tried really hard, I think, at half time to prepare the team for this comeback and the fight and the kind of direct approach that Heidenheim are known for. They mm. played that game really, really well. They will survive in the Bundesliga, which is an incredible feat if you look at the size of the club, the size of the town, size of the budget. Um, but... Yeah, Bayern, once again, no resilience, no game management, defensively, all over the shop. Ideal preparation for a Tuesday night at the Emirates. Which I guess is the bigger game for them. It's unlikely they're going to drop out of the top four or anything, and they're not going to catch Bayer Leverkusen at the top of the, the table. But what, what does it mean for what kind of Bayern we'll see on Tuesday? Are they going to be wounded Lions? fired up and, and desperate to prove their worth again or are they just a bunch of flops at this point definitely wounded uh, whether there be lions or not um, there isn't really that much to suggest that they will somehow magically click they had one decent game maybe against a uh, big opposition or biggish op- biggish opposition in 2024 that was against Lazio at home mm. and Lazio were pretty shocking that mm. night mm. otherwise the big games have all gone against them. They lost against Leverkusen, lost against Dortmund, lost away to Lazio, might well lose tomorrow night at Arsenal as well, or whenever you're hearing this pod. Uh, I mean, people are clutch- clutching at straws at the moment, or if you want to turn that on its head, I can't remember personally Bayern going into a quarterfinal game on such a sort of downtrodden, unhappy note. It's been a long, long time since we've been in that situation. Maybe the underdog kind of spirit or this, you know, never say die, we've got nothing to lose. We've Thing got Harry come Kane to the as fore. well. We've got Harry Kane. Mm. Second legs at home. Second legs at home, but... We've got Nabry. What did Nabry do last we, time he visited London? He, he scored a lot of goals. Four um, goals against Spurs. Against, against Spurs. Spurs. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. yeah. Wow. I mean, Bayern have won all their big games in London recently. They won against Chelsea mm-hmm. in 2020. They won against uh, Arsenal numerous times. They won against Spurs. And, of course, they won at Wembley to win the Champions League. And Bayern have gone back to the team hotel that they always stay well, that's that, for then, those isn't it, really? big games. But whether that's enough, James, I'm... Not so sure. I'm mm. personally, if I was of the Bayern Munich persuasion, but I'm not I'm completely neutral. Of course. I'd be, <laughs> Having said we earlier. <laughs> I'd be very happy if the tie is still alive after the first leg. OK. Mm. Arsenal struggled to replicate their amazing Premier League form when they took on Porto in the last 16. There is a strong case, though, to say that the kind of football that Bayern play, or the kind they don't play as well, will be a more advantageous arena for Arsenal to be trying their uh, trying their brand of the beautiful game. Bayern's defeat means that Bayer Leverkusen are now 16 points clear and can seal the title. Can seal the title next weekend. Rafa before that, having beaten Union 1-0 this weekend with another goal from Florian Wirtz, they have a Europa League date with West Ham. Is there much excitement about that in Germany? I mean, Leverkusen don't have a massive footprint as a club. Um, But of course, people think that they can can go all the way and do the trouble. They should win the cup. They played in the 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 semi-final last week and destroyed second division Fortuna Dusseldorf. They'll be huge favourites against Kaiserslautern. They have all but won the league. And in Europa League, I think it's them or Liverpool. 
in terms of the teams that are really left yeah. in the competition. Mi- Mil- Milan is pretty strong as well. Yeah. Yeah. Roma not playing bad either. Uh, yeah. Atalanta, of course, who will be taking on Liverpool this yeah. Thursday. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, I think there is excitement, but of course the excitement would be bigger if this was a slightly <coughs> more uh, better supported club. Right, Raf. <laughs> We spoke earlier about how Athletic have a barge for when they win big trophies. In Leverkusen, do they have anything? Yeah. What do they? What do they wheel out when they're nothing? <laughs> they have a real problem because traditionally trophies are being celebrated in front of the crowds in mm. the big town square mm. on the balcony of mm-hmm. the town hall. They don't have a balcony big enough to celebrate. In in Leverkusen, in Leverkusen. In so the there's a real kind of town question. Is Leverkusen. It's very small. The town um, hall. So there's a real the, ta- the town hall the, or whatever it's called, the city main. Yeah, but it doesn't yeah. have big enough. It doesn't have a big outside problem? space okay. for the team to celebrate in front of the crowd. So now they're really not sure what to do, and they might celebrate inside the stadium. Mm. They might celebrate outside the stadium, but uh, it shows you they're not prepared <laughs> in that sense. They might just have to build their own. Well, it could be worth it, as you said. It could be a number of celebrations heading their way. All right. We'll talk more about the other Europa League ties later on, but more Champions League after this. Jules, Real Madrid taking on Man City. What's your take? Uh, The revenge of last season. Really, I still don't see, even with Bellingham, how Real Madrid can beat this City team over two legs. I think City are too strong. They're too good. I think they press too well uh, for a Real Madrid team that is not that press resistant. So I just see it going one way. Mm. Alvaro, you've said that Real Madrid are stronger this season yeah. than the side which faced uh, Man City last time around. What do you think? Uh, I think that uh, Manchester City is not as strong as they were last year in the semi-finals when in the second leg they produced, for me, the, the performance of 2023. That first half against uh, Real Madrid at the Etihad was uh, unparalleled. And Real Madrid is, a str- is a stronger than they were last season. Uh, they are going to win La Liga, something that they didn't achieve last season mm. either. I think that uh, they could do with a break and they have had a break because they haven't played football for nine days. And this is pretty important for Real Madrid too, to recover some players. Uh, physically, they've been strong. And uh, I think that the game is going to be quite contested. I don't know if Kyle Walker is going to be in the squad or not because, the, because he's the antidote for a player like Vinicius. And if Kyle Walker is not there, maybe Manchester City can suffer a little bit more because Vinicius um, will have a chance to probably leave behind a, a player who is not naturally a right back. Uh, talking about the likes of Akanji or John Stones or even Rico Lewis, who is <coughs> not defensively like Kyle Walker. So mm-hmm. I think that is going to be quite contested. There is a feeling in Spain that uh, the squad of Manchester City is uh, way better than Real Madrid, but other than the th- center forward. The rest is pretty level, in my opinion. And uh, the only thing that Real Madrid should be worried of is that. Uh, Camavinga, Bellingham and Vinicius are one uh, card away from suspension. Mm. So those are the probably the three most pivotal players or three of the most pivotal players that Real Madrid has. OK. Real Madrid didn't look all that convincing in the last 16 against no. RB Leipzig. Really had Leipzig's uh, wayward finishing to thank for making it through. Hmm. And yet... Uh, they, I mean, they, they qualified. I, that's why I say that they, they needed a break as well. Okay. I, th- I think Real Madrid uh, has been very, very lucky. Uh, to find um, this uh, weekend off in the calendar, mm. as much as Barcelona, as much as Atletico de Madrid. And um, the energy levels are there. Uh, Real Madrid has uh, been very physical this season. Uh, I think that the physical strength of Real Madrid in midfield cannot be matched by any side in La Liga. And they have won many games like this with Fede Valverde, Bellingham, Camavinga, Chouameni, right. who is playing as a centre-back. And uh, again, I think that the belief is that they can make it. But uh, this is probably the best, the best game you can find in Europe. A- ahead of a previous Man City Real Madrid clash, are you getting any strange <laughs> tingles about, about this one? Uh, that was around Karim Benzema, I mm. think. Benzema no longer at the, at the club. I would point out that Madrid's defensive record this season has been really impressive now, mm-hmm. in that they've only conceded yeah. 20 goals in 30 games. In the last five at home, they've only conceded Uno. Yeah, mm. they've not lost at the Bernabeu all season. And Rudiger played very well against Haaland, particularly in the first game last yeah. year. Do they have Militao back? 
Eh, I don't feel like he's gonna be ready to play 90 minutes. He played a little bit um, a week ago against Athletic Club Bilbao, but that was in the stoppage time in the sec- of the second half. That was his return mm. after a lengthy uh, spell in the sideline. So I don't think that he's ready to start personally. Okay. Uh, but James is right. I mean, Real Madrid has been quite solid defensively. They have lost only against Atletico this season, too. Mm. At the end of the day, that's a very remarkable run uh, to face Manchester City. Do you know when the last time Real Madrid were knocked out at the quarterfinals of the Champions League was? The last time Real Madrid was knocked uh-huh. out on the quarterfinals in the Champions League. Uh-huh. Uh, are we talking about uh, 2010 or something? No, uh-huh. more, no. Uh-huh. Farther away. Uh-huh. <laughs> you tell me. 2003-04 by Monaco. There you go. Morientes. Beautiful with Morientes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, Mor- Morientes scoring many goals against uh, Real Madrid, as far as I remember, right? Yeah. yeah. He was on loan from Real exactly. Madrid, in fact. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Of course, there have been other occasions they didn't make the quarterfinals, but yeah. when they've been in the quarterfinals, not since So that's your prediction. Four. They're I'm going not, through. I'm not predicting anything, but uh, this one looks wide open to me, as does one of Wednesday's clashes, Atletico Dortmund. Atletico Dortmund. No Griezmann or Griezmann? Will he be there? Will he be all partied out after that <laughs> tough, tough Tuesday for him? Yeah, and after buying, oh, so Monday, m- buying so many gifts and yeah. uh, having to please, uh, you know, uh, three, three kids who want attention. Kids. Yeah, yeah, it's true. Uh, I think that he's going to be in the squad. He's going to be in the lineup. Same thing. I think that will apply for Alvaro Morata. Uh, mostly because Memphis um, is one of the fresh injury concerns and I think that he's going to be out for an extra month. Okay. So Alvaro Morata has to pay. Has to play, uh, 100%. And uh, Atletico looked uh, jaded to me. They lost against Barcelona 3-0 uh, in mid-March and they look like a team that needed a break. Uh, we have spoken about Atletico. They are no longer the um, six-yard uh, box force that they were uh, in the past when they were so happy controlling the six-yard box and defending there. Uh, nowadays they suffer more, but on the other hand, the link-up uh, game of Atletico, especially when they try counters and all that, is pretty decent. So mm. I, I expect a good game here, really. I think that Atle- uh, Of course, if the second leg was at Civitas Metropolitano, I will tell you that I think that Atletico is the slightly favorite. But being the second leg in the Signal Iduna Park, mm. I think that it's going to be pretty leveled. Do you know, Adle- you probably do know this, Atletico have never lost a Champions League knockout tie at home, either in the Metropolitano yeah. or even before at the Calderon. Incredible, no? And, and Simeone's numbers uh, are pretty incredible in the Champions League as mm. well. He, he has coached 100 games in the Champions League for Atletico, 49 wins, a 49% win at the Champions League, which is the highest level. It's really good. Mm. Raf, what say you? Uh, as we heard before, Dortmund not making the best of uh, preparations for this with that defeat at the weekend against Stuttgart, ending a five-game winning streak. And all of their best performances have come in the Champions League this year. They won the group of death, didn't they? Mm-hmm. Mm. They, they are unbeaten in the Champions League? Mm, yes. Possibly. This yeah. year. Yeah. This year, not, yeah. Not, <laughs> not historically. <laughs> <laughs> that would be incredible. Mm. Yeah. Um, okay. They think they think this is a kind draw. It could have been a lot worse, right, for them. And Atletico probably think the same. same Atletico, thing. I think, yeah. would have been happy with Dortmund. So, pretty open game. Okay, it is. They lost to Paris, by the way. In the, I think that they did against Paris. Dortmund. Yeah. First game. Yeah, they did. Yeah, two nil. I think. Yeah. Yes. yeah, and that's it. Since then, they are unbeaten. Yeah. Well, thank you for mentioning our friends in Paris. <laughs> Because arguably the standout tie of this round of games will be coming on Wednesday night as the Parc de France plays host to Paris Saint-Germain against Barcelona. Producer Charlie, roll the remontada remix. I'm just kidding, Jules. There is no remontada remix. There's no reason to bring that up, except for the fact that it was one of the most extraordinary things anyone ever saw in the Champions League. For many people, for many neutrals, if you will, it, it kind of defined the Parisians' European identity. And I imagine that it's seared into the consciousness of every PSG supporter, of whom you know many. This week is a huge chance for PSE, PSG to redefine themselves, quite apart from getting revenge on, on, on Barcelona. What's the mood in Paris? It's great. I mean, they beat Barcelona since the remontada anyway, so... Um, it's not. It's not like if they hadn't played them since the remontada. It was a crazy night uh, where 
you know, the referee's performance, I think, didn't really help PSG. But the atmosphere is good, yeah, really good. Okay. Are you, how, how do you feel about uh, Paris Saint-Germain? A 1-1 one, one draw the weekend, but it was, a, it was a kind of scratch PSG team, very much drawn up with a, a view to the Champions League game coming up. Yeah, Luis Enrique said he would make some rotation and he did more than that, I think, because we didn't expect such a, like a C or a D team. Two 17-year-olds who never started for the first team played, Zagre and, and Mayulu. Um, the others, you had Carlos Soler and players like that. Um, Milan Skriniar coming back from an injury. So they were clearly a bit lost on the pitch so in the first half. Uh, I think the most important was not to lose and they... Final equalizer out quite late. It's 27 game unbeaten now uh, since the beginning of November against Milan. So they're on they're on good form, and obviously every every starter from Wednesday night, maybe apart from Gonzalo Ramos, had a rest this weekend, which was pretty good for them. And now they see it's obviously Luis Enrique facing Xavi and his former club again. He was on the bench for the Remontada game. Uh, there's a lot of little narratives within this game, of course, the story, Messi and Neymar, everything. Mbappe playing against uh, another Spanish opposition opponent like against Real Sociedad before playing for Real Madrid next season. So there's a lot of little stories in it which should be really good. Excellent. Uh, yeah, I think that Dembélé is another player who returns to Camp Nou. Uh, sorry, to <laughs> Barcelona ground or he will return. But uh, I think that this uh, Paris side is uh, better than the previous ones. As strange as it sounds, well, Jules uh, knows much better than, uh, than I about it. But uh, it's not frank fragmented in two when the opponent has the possession with Neymar, Messi and Mbappe up front not helping. And also this season we haven't seen that uh, naivety in defence of Paris. Uh, do you remember when uh, and we have seen this in February for three years in a row, I think, Kimpembe, Marquinhos and Donnarumma just having an entanglement at the back and giving balls away very easily. This year Paris is like more mature. Uh, Luis Enrique was very, very good. I remember uh, placing Dembélé as a number 10 uh, at Real Sociedad ground as well and that dismantled Real Sociedad completely. Mm -hmm. I think that Barcelona will, hand, will find it difficult but the most important thing for Barcelona is to find out how they want to play the game plan because without Frenkie de Jong and Pedri who I think that Frenkie is, is going to be back, Pedri not so much. Uh, without them Barcelona has been very good at the counter-attack and the midfield's uh, uh, work effort has been fantastic. Fermin, um, who is Rafinha playing as a midfielder. I mean, they've been putting the shift, the work in there, and Barcelona has been winning with that style. For now, the conundrum for Xavi is, now that Frank is back and probably Pedri will be back very soon, if not for the second leg, will I give the reins of the team to these two guys again, or will I continue playing with the guys who have taken mid here? Mm -hmm. Big question. George, you mentioned PSG's unbeaten run. How many games is that again? 27. 27. Very nice. And the cup game last midweek, which saw the prisons through to the, the final, uh, which uh, it's going to be coming up against Lyon. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah. May 25th. May 25th. On the road in Europe, that's kind of been the, the biggest Achilles heel of, of this PSG side this season with the famous defeat away at St. James's Park, defeat at San Siro as well. Is there any particular reason why that's happened and how much concern does that give you ahead of you know, this tie? The first game's at home, but there'll be one at uh, Montjuic. Yeah, it's, um, it was worrying at the time. Against Dortmund away, they, they drew 1-1. It was quite nervy as well. And Dortmund had a lot of chances. They were still a bit too open. And since then, really, let's be honest, they haven't been tested much because they've been better than everybody else, really, league-wise. So we will see. I, I think in midfield, certainly, it feels like Zaire Emery has, has grown and Vitinha as well. And Fabian Ruiz seems to be the third man now. And we very likely, I think, start against Barcelona on Wednesday night. And they've been playing well together, them three. Defensively, Beraldo, the Brazilian new signing from January, has, has done some really good things, despite being so young and discovering Europe and, and having never played in the Champions League before. Against Lewandowski, it might be, a, it might be a, a, a bit tough for him. But collectively, it seems that this team is defending better maybe than when they played against Newcastle and when they played against Milan and Dortmund as well. I, I, don't, I don't see this Barca team pressing high and certainly pressing with the same intensity that we saw the other teams in Europe doing it so far to PSG. I mean, they can try, but this is not something they do every week and like the others. So I don't know, we see, but certainly the away form in the Champions League, especially 
compared to the home form is is one of the reasons why I think this tie is quite nicely balanced. I don't think there's one more favorite than the other between the two teams. And the return in, in Catalonia, I think, will is, is playing a big part for what Barca is actually not too far from PSG. I think PSG make the final. Any reason, James, or just... I think there's less expectation around them this time around. I think mm. that helps. I, th- I think it's Killian's last season. It's ex- anticipated to be his last season. I think the team has more of a balance to it than it has done in, in, in the recent past. I think there's less, there are fewer question marks around it. And I think if you look more generally at the Champions League, aside from City, you know, I think it's, 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 anyone's, it's anyone's game. And I think they they just seem to be further along in whatever this new project is at PSG than Barcelona do at, mm. at their current stage. Barcelona still have those injuries. I saw them you know, play against Napoli and whilst they came through in that, they were still quite open. And I, I, I came away from Montjuic thinking that if you, you have a team that has, let's say, Kylian Mbappe or Dembele up front, they will punish, they will punish them in a way that Napoli were unable to, given how Napoli went into that fixture. So I, th- I, th- I think, yeah, they've got a coach who's experienced, who's won this competition, who knows what it means to go deep in it before. Absolutely. So, there you go. Jules, PSG in the final alongside Inter, of course. Well, yeah. no, I get the chance to have a fresh <laughs> prediction now. I mean, Inter but, should be in this, this quarterfinal. I don't, I'm still scratching my head. But the, the remark about Kylian is, is correct. I mean, right. when, when Xavi takes that blackboard in the, in the locker room on, on Wednesday mm. evening, and he, he will put the name of Mbappé. It will be the first thing that he will write in that blackboard uh, how to how to stop him. And I wonder how he's going to do it because he can send Araujo uh, to the right and play as a right back. This is the plan against Vinicius when Vinicius played against Barcelona. Kunde has been playing very well lately. Maybe Kunde can stop Kylian. But every time Kylian has been playing in Spain, he's been so good. He's been so good. The plan is basically he's the best player, and I think that he's going to make the difference. I mean, uh, football sometimes is that simple, really. Very nice. All right, that's coming up on Wednesday. The following evening, we'll be having Conference League and Europa League quarterfinals, and we'll move on to those next. Europa League on Thursday, Liverpool face Atlanta. Benfica up against Marseille. We're in a rotten run of form at the moment. Leverkusen, as mentioned previously, host West Ham. And at San Siro, it's an all-Italian affair between Milan and Roma. First time these two teams have ever met in a European context, James. I didn't realise that. How excited are they in Italy about this game? Quite excited because both teams go into it playing really well and in great form. And there's a lot of positivity in both camps. Milan are now kind of running away with second place. It feels like a team that changed a lot in the summer and had an injury crisis in the winter. That's all settled down now and purely knows his best team. And they're really fun to watch. Milan at the moment. Roma are kind of surfing on this wave of having been released from uh, the shackles of Jose Mourinho, having De Rossi in charge. De Rossi keeps on talking up the team. You know, he says, I've got really good players. It's unacceptable that Roma have not been in the Champions League for five years. And they seem to be vibing off that. And so I think Milan should go into this game as favourites. They were in the Champions League semi finals last year. And I think they are, I think they've got, yeah, I mean, it's, it's hard to call in terms of who's got the more talented forward players, but I think that's still Milan, even though Roma have Dybala. Lukaku, for example, has only scored twice in 2024 in the league. Tammy's back. Tammy came back and played, what, 10, 12 minutes at the end of the derby. Um, Pellegrini's been in great form, but <laughs> I would give Milan the slight edge at this moment. Okay, that's just one of the games on Thursday. Also involves, as we mentioned, uh, Jules Marseille. What on earth is going on with the Marseillais as they prepare to take on a Benfica side who got beaten in a huge game in uh, Mm. the uh, Primera Liga at the weekend, defeated by Sporting. Mm. Yeah, Marseille lost four in a row now. They were beaten on Monday night by a really good Lille team and Paolo Fonseca's. Uh, side who are really outstanding. They are in great form. They would give Aston Villa a really good run for their money on Thursday as well. And for Marseille, started so well under Joe Biden and now, not just on him, (laughs) 
but four defeats in a row some of the players start moaning that training is not hard enough now nah, not intense enough they moan that it was too intense with Gattuso that it was too tactical under Marcelino which is usual usually what happens in Marseille they moan a lot and now you know Gasset was Gasset was the kind of like father figure that they didn't have with Gattuso because he was too hard on them but now he's actually too kind because he doesn't work them hard enough it's, it's really hard to follow a little bit but this is Europe. It will be at the Velodrome. There's obviously a lot of history between the two clubs, going back to the Vata handball, obviously, in the European the Cup first, uh, the first, back the in 1990. Sorry, the first game's at Benfica, actually. Yeah. No, I mean, in the Velodrome, in, like, you know, in general, uh, the atmosphere oh, okay. would be great there mm -hmm. for the second leg. And obviously the history, we talked a lot about France all last week and this week about Vata and that handball and that game that even if you're not a Marseille fan, you, remember, you would remember uh, from when you watch it because it was such a bl obvious blatant handball that the referee clearly didn't give against Benfica that enabled them then to meet Milan in the final to lose the final. Uh, but Marseille were harshly done and... They're going to meet again. So 34 years on to have again Benfica against Marseille would be very, very special. There you go. That's the historical precedent that everyone's talking about in France, not any other ones that may have been mentioned previously in this this podcast. Yeah. All right. Uh, Benfica, whose uh, European form has been patchy. But you could say the same about Marseille. The other tie in these uh, Europa League quarters is Liverpool against Atalanta. James. Yeah, it is. I think Liverpool going to this is obvious favourites. Atalanta played Liverpool at their peak under Gasparini in the group stages of the Champions League a few years ago and did very, very well against them. But it's a different team now. It's one that doesn't have Ilicic, Papu. Um, has got a very exciting forward line, but they've just lost um, to, to Cagliari, which was a bit of a surprise for the weekend, particularly uh, regarding their own ambitions to get into the Champions League. Um, they lost in the Cup, the first leg of their semi-final against Fiorentina. Um, as well and their goalkeeper Kaniseki uh, made one of the saves of the, the season um, just yeah, aesthetically to, to watch the save is quite reminiscent of that I think what was it 1990s ad of a Peter Schmeichel um, mm. save where he was really outstretched it was brilliant so I think they'll need Kaniseki to be at his, his very best um, yeah they can make something of this tie uh, and it helps I think that the second leg will be in Bergamo um, but, you know, I think Liverpool, even on the basis of what we saw at Old Trafford in the mm -hmm. first half, um, if they play like that, it'll be, it'll be tough for, for Atlanta. OK. Thursday night, we'll be rounding up all the Europa League highlights on TNT Sport. Why not join us? Too many games to follow. So just tune in around about 10.30 to get all the best bits of not just those four quarterfinal times, but the Conference League ones as well. Uh, George, you already mentioned that you think a little strong favourites. Was it you called them against Aston Villa? Um, no, I, th I think they're going to give them a good run for their money, for sure. Uh, it's a really good team. Lille, the way they play, Paulo Fonseca is doing a great job there. They are, I think, in course and potentially qualifying for the Champions League next season, which would be a great achievement for them. Uh, and Jonathan David is in great form. The Grova is in great form on the right wing. Cabela scored a lovely goal at the weekend as well on Friday night. Defensively, they're strong. They've got Lenny Yoro, the 18-year-old centre-back that everybody wants to sign that seems to be heading for Real Madrid potentially next season. Uh, and even in midfield, they've got experience. They've got players who played in Champions League before. They've got experience with players who've I've had that kind of experience before. So I think it's going to be great. And this Unai Emery going back to France, of course, for the second leg. They also have the second leg uh, uh, back at home at the Pierre Mora Stadium. So the atmosphere will be brilliant. And it's, it's good. And I think Villa, obviously, because they're the Premier League side, have to be favourite, especially with Watkins back. But Lille, Lille are not to take lightly. OK, very good. The other Conference League ties are Club Bruges against Pauk. Yes. Victoria Pilsen hosts Fiorentina, who are smarting from a 1-0 defeat Sunday against uh, Juventus. Come back to that maybe a bit later on. And also on Thursday, Olympiacos will be playing Fenerbahce, who ha have been kind of at the centre of one of the strangest stories of this weekend. Hmm. Will it be Fenerbahce's under-19s playing in that I'm game? I'm not sure which lineup they're going with, but as you referenced, their under-19s were uh, given the task of taking on Galatasaray 
uh, this weekend in the Turkish Super Cup, which was originally due to have been held last December in Saudi Arabia, but wasn't. Why? Because Nick Miller wrote a, uh, yes. a, a long article about this in which he explains all. All right. So go to uh, The Athletic and you will find it. Anyway, so conveniently, the Turkish authorities scheduled the Super Cup for four days before Fenerbahce's big game against Olympiakos away in Piraeus. And Fenerbahce, who I've already been furious about their treatment in Turkey, but you'll recall the extraordinary pitch invasion a few weeks ago, which has seen some pretty minor penalties handed out to the, the fans who took part, but seen a couple of Fenerbahce players given a one-game ban. In fact, uh, Nick Miller in The Athletic writing a piece last week, I think it was Nick actually, um, detailing this extraordinary annual annual general meeting which Fenerbahce held at their stadium. Tens of thousands of fans turned up, and among the things discussed was the notion of initiating a withdrawal from the Turkish Super League. Now, that wasn't approved, and I'm, there was no, I don't think, any concrete plan as to where they would play instead. But that is the depth of anger about what they feel is a kind of systemic prejudice against Fenerbahce. Anyway, that's the team that's going to be in Piraeus taking on Olympiakos on Thursday. Very good. Jules, did you see what happened to Ajax this weekend? <laughs> I saw. It's the uh, Jordan Henderson's effect, isn't it? He's turned their form over around so well since he joined the, the club. Poor guy. He they actually are worse now than they were <laughs> before. I know he didn't play. He didn't play the other day when they drew again at the last minute. Two, Imagine two. if he had played. Sorry, I watch all their game just to see him play. And when he plays, he's not good. And when he doesn't play, they are not good either. So, you know. They lost 6-0 at the hands of Feyenoord. Uh, Feyenoord had 30 shots. Ajax had one. That's their biggest ever defeat, certainly against Feyenoord. I think possibly ever. And all sorts of players coming out and saying that they were a disgrace and they betrayed the fans after. It does seem this is a, a real nadir for the famous Amsterdam side. They also, this week, had to suspend their new CEO because he'd been doing insider trading in the club shares. Uh, yes. Anyway, we touched on the celebrations, but we haven't talked too much about the game, which saw <laughs> Athletic Club de Bilbao hmm. after five straight final defeats finally lift a trophy again yeah and um, at some point when Mallorca scored the first goal it looked like uh, Athletic Club Bilbao was going to lose another final because you know um, all the pressure could have piled up over the shoulders of Athletic de Bilbao players but they played well in the circumstances I think that uh, the atmosphere was a double-edged thing because uh, 80,000 people from Bilbao were in Sevilla, mm. but only mm, the half or less could make it to La Cartuja. How many were ground. back at the San Mamés? Because that looked extraordinary as well. Uh, San, San Mamés was full. Uh, San Mamés has an attendance of uh, just a little bit under 50. With big video screens around yeah. the pitch. So then 80,000 in Sevilla was in the game, in the ground or outside. Then 50,000 at the San Mamés. Uh, and you know many other fans who were in bars and all that. I mean, the city stopped literally stopped for uh, no, not literally. The city stopped for uh, the game, obviously. And uh, I think that Athletic Club Bilbao deserved to win at the end of the day because uh, Nico Williams at some point said, "All right, we're not losing this final." Mm -hmm. Him and Sunset, uh, I've been saying this before. They are probably the best two players that Athletic Club Bilbao have. And uh, Nico Williams was setting up a lovely ball for Ojan Sunset, and his finish was excellent. That was the draw. And after that, the game went into extra time and penalties. Did he not set up the Mallorca opener, though? One of them passes back in a very... Ah, Nico. It was uh, yeah, Nico, yeah, Nico. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 sorry. I, I had forgotten the bad memories. Yeah. Completely. <laughs> I, had, I had erased them from, from my mind. Yeah, but uh, then in the penalties, there was an unsung hero, which is the second choice goalkeeper, mm. uh, Julen uh, Aguirre Zabala. Mm, who was excellent. Mallorca missed their penalties. Uh, probably you have seen how Javier Aguirre assigned the penalties to the players no. of Mallorca, but it's very nice because uh, basically mm, he kind of ruffled them. So he got all the Mallorca players around him uh, and he started saying the first penalty goes to you. And everyone started celebrating the second one to you because the players didn't know who were going to take it. And uh, Javier Aguirre, in a way to motivate uh, their players, right. he did it like that. So every time a player was assigned with a penalty, yeah. everyone was celebrating. They didn't Except win. Except for them, probably. No, but they, <laughs> they did the same thing in the, in the, in the semifinals, I believe, and it worked against Real Sociedad. Right. So, you know, uh, that was Javier Aguirre. He spent the whole week uh, just... Um, taking the pressure off the, his players, saying that the Athletic Club Bilbao was the favourite. And at the end, they won. And, uh, you know, it was a very special moment for 
many, many reasons. First of all, for Nico and Iñaki Williams, I will go with them because um, when Athletic won the cup in 1984, uh, there were obviously no black players or mm, any players from uh, another different races in Bilbao. And, uh, you know, even when I was uh, born in Bilbao and I was growing, I remember that the demographics of the city were mm. what they were. I mean, we were all white. And uh, I remember that in a school of 2000 that I was in, uh, Jesuitas, uh, there was only one black person. Mm. One black person. And we were about 2000 altogether in Bilbao City Center. And now, uh, if you go to that same school or if you go to many places in Bilbao, you will see that there are different races uh, coexisting with each other. Mm. Uh, the Williams brothers are uh, the, por the personification of that, the embodiment of that. So Nico is excellent. I don't know how long he's going to last for Athletic Club Bilbao. Then the Marcos and Muniain, because they lost four finals uh, before this one, and because they started playing for Athletic Club Bilbao in 2009, and they have been the longest serving men of the team, all together with Ander Herrera, but he got spelled out. So for them, it was very special. Muniain lifting the trophy, succeeding Danny, our previous captain in 1984, doing the same thing. Iker Muniain, who had a difficult season because he's not playing a lot, but he played in the final. And then Ernesto Valverde. I think mm. his name gets vindicated again. He's one of the best managers in Spanish football. I think that uh, looking back at his time at Barcelona, it wasn't too bad after all, winning two leagues and one cup. Uh, the thing is that the Anfield thing, uh, Obviously, it was too much for him. It was too much for him. And, uh, you know, I think that uh, the win is not a message because I have uh, read many transcendental like uh, reviews of the win of Athletic Club Bilbao after 40 years, a team that doesn't play with any players that are not either locals or mm. come from the, academy, from the academy. I don't think that we are sending a message to the world or anything like that. No, no, I don't think so. But it's a message to ourselves because every now and then when the season starts badly and all that, you can hear some voices which are normally muted very quickly that maybe we should change the philosophy and all that. But the truth is that no electoral or election campaign uh, when we have a president change or whatever has had the philosophy change as one of the axes. Mm -hmm. I think that is pretty settled in Bilbao and there is a consensus that we have to continue like this. And uh, since the Bosman regulation, you know, which changed football completely because many good players from abroad started coming to La Liga, we haven't been too bad at the end of the day. Uh, we haven't been relegated. Everyone has been relegated but Valencia, Barcelona, Real Madrid and us from 1995 onwards. We've been in uh, five cup finals, one Europa League final. We have won two Super Cups, and uh, in the last call of Luis de la Fuente, the Spanish manager, he called for players from Athletic Club Bilbao. So at the end of the day, we've been, I think, punching above, above our weight, and uh, it's pretty good to stay like this. Excellent. Well, congratulations, Alvaro. Very impressive indeed. What else uh, should we touch on, uh, Rafa? Uh, Rudy Fuller renewing his... Uh contract at the German Affair sporting mm -hmm. director mm -hmm. and which might have a knock-on effect on Julian Nagelsmann's future because ah, mm. uh, Fella would very much like Julian to stay um, so yeah fairly big news in Germany okay so Rudy Nazionale very the nice. flying German on the weekend Rudy. in which his Roma won the derby there won. you go yeah Tante Kete yeah well, and Kita then. Kita, yeah. 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 Uh, so, uh, so it's more likely that Nagelsmann won't be joining Bayern then, is that right? I am not sure if that changes the equation for Julian. Right, okay. But uh, the German FA, I think, especially with Rudy being involved, would love to extend the contract with Nagelsmann before the Euros. Okay. This summer is likely to be, uh, certainly from a Premier League point of view, marked by... Slightly more restrained spending because of PSR and all that kind of thing. Maybe, maybe not. We shall see. But it's going to be one of the most intense summers for managerial moves, I think, we've seen in a long while. Uh, the word in Italy seems to be that one of the names most often touted, Thiago Motta, might now be heading to Turin, James. Yeah, these stories often come out when other clubs are looking for managers and they find out that, oh, that guy we wanted to talk to, we're told we can't talk to him because he's going somewhere else. He's got another job. And yeah, that's something that has been said about uh, Thiago the last, uh, last few weeks. Yeah, let's, let's see. I think there's a quiet revolution going on at Juventus at the moment in which you know, Cristiano Giuntili, the sporting director, he came from Napoli um, late in the summer. And so some of Juventus' early transfer business. They didn't really do much transfer business. They only signed Tim Weah. It was done by a guy called Manna. Manna's going to Napoli, and there's some scouts that are coming 
belatedly from Napoli to Juventus to help with Giuntoli. So I think Giuntoli will put his mark on Juventus really from this summer. And of course, Allegri was not Giuntoli's choice. Allegri is a holdover from Andrea Agnelli's last uh, last appointment, if you like, and gave him a four-year four year job, made him the highest paid coach in the league. Allegri still has a year left on his deal. Um, but you can tell there's been there's been a very interesting silence around this, I would say, over the last few uh, few weeks, at least on the events' part, in terms of, okay, results have started to tailspin a little bit. Let's try and stabilise things. We don't want any distractions. It's really important the team gets into the Champions League and the team continues to progress in the Coppa Italia, and they won in midweek um, against Lazio. So, so yeah, let's see. But, um, yeah, all of a sudden, you're now seeing a flurry of reports linking Juventus with raiding Bologna, you know, Zerxe, Califiori, players like that. So, Antonio, yeah. Antonio Conte, I'm wondering, no one no one speaks about him in Italy anymore? No, they do. I mean, particularly uh, Napoli, uh, uh -huh. for example, but there's, there's a sense that, uh, you know, Antonio has always, uh, because of his winning record, has always had a, a very high salary demand, comes with mm. a big staff, that's expensive as well. There's assumption about Conte that when he comes in, he not necessarily expects a transfer spend, but he expects them to go out and buy players that suit his style of play, which ends up really being expensive. <laughs> um, so, so we'll see. I mean, he 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 spoke openly about being interested in one day coaching Napoli and Roma, but Roma are doing so well, well under De Rossi now. It'd be very difficult, I think, for Roma's owners to to not give De Rossi a the permanent job. And so, at the moment, the only one that's really open I would say is is Napoli even Milan now considering how well Pioli has done since January hmm. um, Milan look like they will be sticking rather than twisting as well mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay Juventus were one of the winners of the weekend over Fiorentina we mentioned this loads of goals in a couple of other fixtures one was uh, Napoli's trip to Monza which saw Monza take the lead and then an incredible period of 14 minutes in which Napoli scored four goals yeah, I mean, this was an incredible atmosphere because uh, the Napoli Ultras travelled, but they, they travelled so that they could only just leave a banner uh, in the away end which said, Assenti come vostri, which is absent like yours. And then it had uh, a portrayal of, of a pair of testicles. Mm. So, you know, they're basically saying that the team's balls are missing. Uh, are missing. And so are we. <laughs> and, and <laughs> but then they got their balls back. <laughs> they did, and they put them in the back of the net. Nice, in quite spectacular fashion, mm -hmm. with uh, an incredible leap from Victor Ozimen. Right, yeah, uh, Ozimen who seemed to leap a hundred feet in the air and then land on his head. Face plant after, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so you know, in some respects, good that he still wears this mask. Mm. A Politano with one. I know Jules was was saying that um, the guy for Goal FC right. scored the goal of the weekend, but Politano's was lovely, mm. um, sort of outside the box. The ball is going away from him, so he takes like two steps back and then he volleys it into the top corner. Beautiful. The other goal for that Napoli score was really nice as well. Um, so, yeah, Napoli winning, um, but is it too late for them to get back into the Champions League? I think it probably is. Um, although, you know, as we mentioned, Roma's win, big for them in terms of Champions League credentials, particularly on a weekend in which Bologna drew nil-nil with Frosinone and Atalanta lost in Sardinia against Cagliari. Mm, indeed so. Currently, Napoli lies seventh. They are seven points outside the top five, if that is the number of teams that City has sends to uh, the Champions League next season, which will be in a new format and you know all that, etc. So let me just mention from a City out point of view that there was a great game as well Saturday evening. Empoli taking on Torino. Beating them, was it 3 2 or 4 3? It was 3 2, no? 3 2. Yeah. Beating them 3 2. Now, this game was broadcast free to air on British TV, James. It was. Rolling yeah. back the years, James. Yeah. Were so, you in a piazza with a Gazette of Sport? Yeah. No. Yeah. Oh, every Saturday <laughs> they just, evening. They just didn't show that. Just bit. didn't show that. <laughs> so, uh, this is part of a new. So, this is going to be for the remaining Saturday evenings of the season? Yeah. Uh, for the remaining seven match days, they've got the. Late game on a Saturday, mm. the 7.45, I think in the original uh, agreement that TNT, uh, that City has struck with TNT three years ago, there was a there was a carve out where they could sell the late Saturday game. They haven't been able to do it up until now. Mm. 
and so ITB have taken it between now and the end of the season. Is it a try before you buy because the rights are up? We don't know. We we'll don't have know. To see. Okay. But uh, what a good game to start with. Good start. I mean, a lot of people initially was like, well, can't it be the Rome derby? The Rome derby was at five o'clock. Yeah. Surely that's the game you want to go with. I'd got to hold my hands up when they said we're going to start with Empoli Torino. <laughs> <laughs> you know. <laughs> yeah. But you tuned in nonetheless. Tuned James, in and, and you were treated to some great goals oh, and some brilliant drama as Empoli mm -hmm. won it late. And a uh, huge win for them considering they're, yeah, they, they have the Harry Houdini of coaches. In, uh, the magic had been wearing off a little bit for David Di Nicola. This uh, this victory leaves them now uh, two points clear of the bottom three, but uh, there's a ways to go. Rafa, anything else you want to tell us about from the Bundesliga or Jules? Anything else we should know about Liga? Bochum, yeah. Bochum likely to fire the manager. Nice, yeah. Okay. Um, <laughs> Not nice. <laughs> Not very nice. No, no. All oh, right. Well, that's something to look forward to for those long Saturday evenings for the rest of the season. A listener. Right now, though, that comes uh, that brings us to the end of today's show. We'll we'll touch on all the different uh, stories when we return next. What is it Monday? I guess. Mm -hmm. Has to be yeah. Yeah, because we've got more Euro action next week, haven't we? Oh, yeah. For now, many many thanks to Jules. Have a great week, Jules. Enjoy. Are you off to Paris for the game with Barca? Yeah. All right. Well, enjoy that, Alvaro. Many thanks for being with us, James. See you on Wednesday for the Champions League highlights on TNT. That's right. Looking forward to that. And Rafa, see you soon as well. Thanks to Rachel and producer Charlie in the booth and you, listener. We'll see you soon for now from all of us here. It's goodbye. The Totally Football Show podcast is available three times a week, bringing you all the football news you could reasonably be expected to care about. We've got views, we've got stats, we've got analysis, we've got some of the best football writers around and the whole thing is absolutely free. So have a listen on Spotify or Apple Podcasts or all the usual places by clicking on the link below.